1 uh, Corinthians, so the first epistle to the church at Corinth. And when we read these epistles, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, these epistles were written specifically to a group of people who were in a city. And here it's uh, people who were in the city of Corinth. And so Paul had, uh, during his uh, second missionary journey, had gone to first, now it's present day Greece today, but it was called the region of Macedonia, and then Achaia, which is today would be Greece. But when he went to Achaia, one of the cities, one of the most prominent cities in Achaia is the city of Corinth. And when Paul went there, there were no churches. Uh, and he began to preach the gospel, to deliver the message of the gospel. He preached about Jesus Christ, and uh, a group of people there uh, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were saved, they were baptized, and they uh, assembled themselves together and formed the first church at Corinth. And Paul writes this letter to those group of people who had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is encouraging them, and he's um, reminding them here in chapter 15 of what he had told them when he first came to Corinth. And I want you to notice what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. Read the first four verses. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now in typical fashion, what we like to do is we like to stand for the reading of God's Word. And so I would like to invite you to stand with me as we read the Word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we do so in honor of the Lord. We find that uh, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, when the scripture was read, uh, that the people stood up. And there was a sense, uh, if you've ever been to a courtroom, uh, you know that when the judge comes in, everybody stands. Uh, and in the same way, when we open the Word of God, uh, these are not the words of men, these are the words of God. Amen. And we stand out of reverence and respect uh, for the Lord. So notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. The Word of God says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I'd like to bring your attention back to verse 1. What you notice, he speaks of the gospel, and he says, I declare unto you, the gospel, and he says three things about the gospel. Notice, first of all, which I preached when he was there. Number two, which ye have received. And number three, wherein ye stand. So Paul preached the gospel in the city of Corinth. The gospel was received by those people to whom he is writing. And for those who have received the gospel, he says, you now stand in the gospel. So I'd like to preach a message this morning that I've entitled, The Gospel Wherein Ye Stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the gospel that was preached then, that those people received and where they stood. We are grateful today for the gospel that was preached to us, which we have received and wherein we stand. And I do pray today that if there's someone here today that hears the preaching of the gospel, I pray that they might receive it and they might stand in the gospel. We pray that you do works in our hearts as we have this special emphasis on this Family Sunday. We thank you for all the families that are represented here today. May everything that is said and done in this hour honor and glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This being the Family Sunday, we do this every year, and uh, many times I'll have a guest preacher who comes and preaches with an emphasis on marriage and the home and, and the family, and uh, sometimes, unfortunately, I have to preach, but the Lord uh, puts things on my heart and uh, to communicate, but I, I wonder this morning as we begin by 
uh, with a question, what is the central theme of our lives? Uh, what is what is it that, that motivates us? What is it that moves us? What is it that moves us to action? When we read here in our text, we read about Paul, and he is, again, uh, looking back at a time when he came to the city, and he's recounting uh, what he said. He was recounting the fact that when he came there, he came to a city that had not heard the gospel before. He came to a group of people who uh, were ignorant to those things, and the people that were there, evidently a number of them believed or they received the gospel. And he writes to them that have received the gospel and says, you are now, in effect, standing on the gospel. That's, you, that's where you are standing. And I'm interested in those words when Paul says, wherein ye stand. He says in verse 2, by which also ye are saved... If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. And so Paul, in a sense, is bringing back a memory of what he first preached to them. He says, remember, that is the gospel that saved you. That's the gospel wherein you stand. That's the gospel that you've received. That's the gospel that was preached unto you. But it's important here to bring that back to their memory. It is interesting here how many times in the scripture we find the emphasis of those who have believed the message of the gospel, but the Bible reminds them of the message that they first believed. And really the question I have for us today, as we think about the gospel wherein you stand, as we think about our homes, does our home in the practical sense exemplify or exhibit the gospel that we have received and wherein we stand? Now, for us to be able to answer that question and to get there, I, I do want to clarify some things and first of all, ask the first question, which is fundamental. If we are going to exhibit the gospel in our homes, we first must know what the gospel is. But we have to have an understanding of what is the gospel and our text tells us what the gospel is. Notice he says, obviously, this gospel was, was preached, uh, this gospel was received, this uh, gospel, notice, uh, saved them. But what is actually the gospel? If it saves us, what is it that saves us? If it's something that uh, men receive, what is it that they receive? And how is it that they receive it? And how is it that he preached? And what is it that he preached? Well, notice verse 3, he tells them exactly what the gospel is. Do you notice? He says, and by the way, the word gospel just simply means good news. It is something that you publish. It is uh, something that is newsworthy. Now, if you uh, turn on the news today and open the newspaper, a lot of that stuff is not newsworthy. Uh, in the sense that it's not going to be good news. It's not going to encourage you. It's not going to lift your spirit up. But this good news will. He says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you... First of all, that which, also, uh, that which I also received. And so he says, you received it, but I want you to know, I first received this thing that I preached and that I communicated to you. Notice how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's the first thing he preached. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Verse 4, and that He, Christ, was buried and that he, Christ, rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I'd like to note a few things. The first thing that we note is that when Paul says, I preach this to you, he says, according to the Scriptures. Now, this is in the New Testament, but when he says according to the Scriptures, he speaks of the Old Testament. In other words, the gospel that he preached, although Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again, Paul said that's something that we find before it happened. You see, the gospel was declared in the Old Testament. It announced Jesus Christ that the Messiah would come and that He would die and that He would be buried, but that after three days He would rise again from the dead. And so Paul says, here is the gospel. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. And those are the facts of the gospel, right? That's the good news. But what does it mean to us? 
He says very clearly that Christ died, but it's not just that He died. Every man dies. There, every man has a day when he is born, and there is going to be a day of death. If you go throughout the graveyard, you always find two dates. The date and the year they were born, and the date and the year when they died. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. And so we understand that everybody who lives dies, but it is not just that Christ died. He says that Christ died for our sins. I want to spend some time talking here about this specific gospel that Christ died for our sins. If you note in this epistle, go back with me to the 6th chapter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, to the same group of people, here is what he says to them back in chapter 6. Now, by the way, when he is writing this letter, he is writing this letter to believers who are part of the church, by the way, who were imperfect. When you think about the church, you should never think about that's a group of perfect people. Far from it. We all have things that we are trying to uh, 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 confess, sins that we try to confess, and we seek to le- live to please the Lord. And, and Paul writes this other to correct many things that was wrong with those who are part of the church. But he reminds them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, notice with me in verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? I want you to think about that word unrighteous. The word righteous means to be, to be perfect with regards to the law. Let's say you have the law, and the law says you do this, you're in good standing. You violate the law, you're in bad standing. If you're in good standing, you are righteous. If you're in bad standing, you are unrighteous. And he says that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's quite a list. And and notice he says that those who are unrighteous, they they do these things. And he says, don't you know, brethren, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we may look at this list and we may think, well, wait a minute, there are things that I I haven't done, but there are other things that surely I have done. He says, nor, verse 10, nor thieves, but then he mentions, nor covetous. You know what a covetous person is? A covetous person is someone who is always looking at what others have and they covet those things, they desire those things, they lust after those things and they don't have them. That's the sin of covetousness. By the way, the sin of covetousness is likened to the sin of idolatry because it is this idea in man that I can find fulfillment and happiness in something Outside of God. That's covetousness. Now notice he's writing to those people who had believed the gospel. And he says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? But notice verse 11 when he says, he says, and such were some of you. That's what he says. And so he reminds them, he says, you remember when I first came to Corinth, when I, when I found you, that's how I found you. You were covetous and thieves and adulterers and effeminate and fornicators and idolaters. That's what you were. But notice what he says to them. But ye, verse 11, but, and such were some of you, but ye are, what's the next word? Washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. As Paul preached the gospel, here is who he preached the gospel to. He didn't preach the gospel to perfect people. He didn't preach the gospel to righteous people. He preached the gospel to the unrighteous. To those who are described here in this text, he says, but here is what they have received. They've received cleansing. Their sin has been washed. The filth and the the mar of sin upon their life has been completely wiped away. And so we ask ourselves, how does someone get to the place? Because that's the gospel. How does someone get to the place as these people were when the gospel was preached to them and they've received it? 
How do they get to that place? How are they washed? We remember the word unrighteous. If you turn with me to the book of Romans, right before 1 Corinthians, you have the epistle to the Romans. Notice in Romans, if you go all the way back with me to chapter 1, in Romans chapter 1, Uh, Paul here, he speaks of the gospel in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And here he is writing to another church. Now this church he had never been. He had never met these uh, people personally. He had never been there physically in Rome. But he writes because he hears of this group, this, these believers in the church at Rome. And here's what he writes to them in verse one, chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, that's the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he says, For therein, therein referring back to the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So when we think about the gospel, we say, well, what is exactly the gospel? The gospel inside the gospel, what is it that's revealed to us? What is it that is declared to us? The righteousness of God. Well, what is the righteousness of God? The fact that God is a holy God. The fact that God is a perfect God. The fact that God gives a standard of morality and he gives it to man. And by the way, the standard of morality is given in the law. And by the way, the law, uh, there is a sense that we have it here in the scriptures. But there is even a sense when, where every single human being has received a knowledge of the law. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 2, he speaks of the group of people who didn't have, as the Jews at the time, who had the Old Testament scriptures he talks about those who did not have a Bible, who did not read the Bible. But notice in Romans 2, he says, he speaks of the, the Gentiles. And notice what he uh, says in verse 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or out excusing one another. You have this idea here that even those who maybe have never read the Bible, who've never been in church, there is still a sense of morality in them. There is still a sense of right and wrong and where does that morality come from? Well, it does not come by chance. It is not the product of some random evolutionary process. It is that which God has put into the heart of every man. The standard of morality whereby man knows that he is guilty, that he is not good enough, that he is not righteous. So in the state of being unrighteous, and by the way, every single person that sits in this room fits in the category of being unrighteous. Even though we may not want to admit it, that's simply the truth. You may know the person that you think is the, the best person you've ever met, but you would have to admit that they are not perfect, that they are not righteous, that they do not meet God's standard of perfection no man can meet God's standard of perfection. And so we have this sense where the gospel declares the righteousness of God, but yet we have this sense where we are unrighteous. Back in Romans chapter 1, he says, notice in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. You see those who are outside of God, who are outside of Christ are under the wrath of God. 
All of us are under the wrath of God because of our unrighteousness. And we may meet people sometimes. You ask, well, or do you think yourself to be a good person? And people think, well, often, well, if I just weigh uh, the, the good in my life and weigh the bad, that as long as the good outweighs the bad, I should be fine. But the truth is that's not how God deals with us. God's requirement is righteousness. He says in Romans chapter 3, a few chapters later, he, by the way, he deals with those who did not have the scriptures and he deals with those who had the scriptures and he says that both those who had the scriptures and those who did not have the scriptures, that they're all under sin. Notice chapter 3 verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, we might say those who had the scriptures and those who did not have the scriptures, that they are all under sin. He says, as it is written, there is none, what's the next word? Righteous, no, not one. And so the Bible declares that there's not one person who meets the standard, the, the perfect standard, perfect standard of God, of righteousness. There is none righteous, no, not one. No man has ever lived a perfect, sinless life. Even Paul acknowledged that he had tried to do pretty good with regards to keeping the law. But when he read the 10th commandment, Thou shalt not covet, it pierced his heart. He recognized that he could not meet the divine standard of God. By the way, the standard of God that is expressed in the law uh, does not, uh, has no power to, to make us righteous, has no power to make us conform to the image uh, of perfection that God demands. Notice what he says in Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. You see, when the law was given by God to express His perfect standard of holiness, He did so to show man that He was not capable of keeping it. That man needed something outside of himself. He says in verse 20 of chapter 3, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is the express standard of God where he expresses his holiness, and we find that the law, uh, by the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified in his sight. Uh, why? Because if we try to keep a certain measure of the law of God, but there is sin on the other side, there is no way that righteous deeds can erase wickedness and sin. You see, you may stand before a judge in the courtroom. I don't know if you've ever been in a courtroom. I have jury duty coming up. That's going to be interesting. But when you stand in the, in the courtroom and the judge says, well, here's the crime and you're guilty, there is no amount of good intent or goodwill on your part where the judge says, well, just because you intend on doing good in the future, we're going to forget all about your sins of the past or your transgressions of the past. That's not the way it works. You have to be punished for your crimes. You see, and God, no amount of good deed can wipe away the sin and the wickedness and the unrighteous in our lives. And so the law of God is expressed as the standard and no good deed can erase the sin. By the way, that was never the intent of the law. The intent of the law was to show us that we were guilty before God. At the end of verse 19, that all that the that uh, every mouth may be stopped. You know why the law was given? So that we couldn't say to ourselves, I'm a good person. That's why the law was given. So that every mouth stands silent before God. So God is the standard of righteousness. We understand that no man is righteous. Again, we're talking about the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And we have the expression of that. Notice in Romans chapter 3, he says, But now, verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, 
of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. You see, when we uh, come before God who is our judge, we are all guilty whether you grew up in church or you grew up outside of church and never read your Bible. We are all guilty before God. We are, but God, He declares His righteousness by sending Jesus Christ in this world. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, He lists some things, but go with me to chapter 5 and verse 8. Notice what the Bible says, Romans 5, 8. But God, well, verse 7, He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Let me put it to you this way. To give your life for someone is difficult. Now, we might say that a parent might say, well, I would give my life for my children. A husband may say, I would lay down my life for my wife. A wife may say, I would lay down my life for my husband. Uh, but here, uh, step outside of that realm of those you love the most. He says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. If you take a random person, you say, that, that's a, th this is a righteous person. It would be hard for you to say, I would die for that person even though they're good. That would be difficult, wouldn't it? But he says, peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. In other words, it would be very difficult for you to be in that position and to give your life for a good person. And we might say, well, okay, well, that's difficult enough. But the standard of God is not even that. Verse 8, but God commendeth, he demonstrated, he proved His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Do you see that? Jesus Christ, when He died for us, He didn't die for a good person. He didn't die for the righteous. No, God demonstrated His love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We wouldn't, it would be difficult for us to give our lives for a good person, no matter how good they may be. But it would be impossible for any of us to lay down our life for a wicked person. You go to the jail. You meet the person that's committed the vilest crimes. And you meet that person. And you saying, I would give my life for that person. No chance. None of us would do that. But do you know that that's exactly what Jesus did for us? That's exactly what He did for us. God commendeth His love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die because of our qualities. He died because of our wickedness. He was our substitute. You say, okay, I understand that Jesus died. When we think about uh, the, the, the righteous of God, our unrighteous, what Jesus did, how do we reconcile those two together? Notice Romans 6, verse 23. He says, for the wages of sin is death. You see, what we earn because of sin is death. And here, death, we're not just simply talking about, we know we're all going to physically die one day. But Hebrews says, it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, death, the judgment. We stand before God. And when we stand before God, no amount of saying, well, I did this good, and I did this good deed, and I did this righteous act. God says, but what about all the sin? What about all the sin? What do you do with the sin? You see, we will stand before God in judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die. That is a reality. Are you prepared to face that reality? The rest of the verse says, but the, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gift of God. We deserve the punishment and the wrath of God upon ourselves, but He gives us in the person of Christ eternal life. Why? Because as chapter 3 says, that He was the propitiation for our sins. That's what he says in verse 25. Whom God of chapter 3 hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. 
You see, when you think about it, if, if we say, well, uh, who is worthy to have eternal life? No man is worthy but one, Jesus Christ. He is righteous. The Bible says he was without sin. But you know what 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says? God, right, through his Son, God hath made him Christ. To be sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, that is where righteousness comes from. It doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from Jesus Christ. When we read of the word propitiation, that's exactly what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. God hath made Him Christ to be sin for us. It'd be like me if you were guilty of committing crimes. Let's go do a simple crime. I'm sure some here have been in the courtroom for going over the speed limit at some point. But if you go over the speed limit and the judge stand before the judge, the judge says, guilty, we have you, here's the picture. There's nothing you can do. There's the proof, you're guilty. The judge says, here's your fine. Well, let's say that day I came to court, I got out my checkbook, and I said, what's the fine, judge? And the judge says, $500. And you may at that moment not have the money to be able to meet that fine, but I came to court and I wrote a check. So you know what? I will pay for your fine. I didn't commit the crime you did, but I'm offering to pay for it. I'm offering to bear the burden of your crime. You see, that is exactly what Jesus did for us. We stand in our own sins before God the judge we are guilty, we are under the wrath of God, but Jesus Christ comes on the scene. He says, I am willing to bear the burden of sin. I am willing to take the punishment in my own body. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So, well, how, how does that happen? How do I become righteous if that's what He gives? How do I become righteous? Romans 4 tells us. He gives us the example of Abraham in Romans 4. And he says in verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? Righteousness. That is where righteousness comes from. He says, by faith. Verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Do you see what the Scripture says? We are all unrighteous, but God, through the Gospel, sent His Son Jesus Christ, His righteousness, to die on the cross to pay for our sin debt, and so He took our sins in His own body, so that we might receive His righteousness. And the way we receive His righteousness is by believing, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith understanding that I can get to heaven on my own. I'm not good enough. But I believe that Jesus is good enough. And because He took my sins, by faith I receive His righteousness. Have you believed? By faith, have you committed yourself Unto the Lord, recognizing that you, in your own self, are entirely unworthy. But in Christ, you can be made worthy. In Christ. By faith. We read a little later in chapter 10. He is writing out of concern for those who are religious. And you know, the truth is often the people who are the hardest to get to the place where they believe the gospel and receive Jesus Christ are those who are religious. Those who think that there is some sense of spirituality in them. Notice Romans chapter 10, 
He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. There are many people today who are zealous about God, but they're not zealous according to knowledge. They don't know the truth about God and His requirement. And here's what they do, verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, what is God's righteousness? Perfect holiness, unblemished, without sin. That is God's righteousness. And so they're ignorant of God's righteousness, that He is perfect and that He cannot abide sin. He cannot look upon sin and be okay with it. And going about, so they are ignorant of God's righteousness, and so they go about, notice, to establish their own righteousness. They establish their own standard that they can meet. They don't want to look at God's standard that they can't meet. They set up a, a religious system or some spiritual life of their own making. And what happens, and they, as a result, because they've set about their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's all you need to do today. You need to simply submit yourself to the righteousness of God. Do not trust in your own righteousness. Do not be ignorant of God's righteousness, but submit yourself to the righteousness of God. He said, how do you submit yourself? Verse 10 of that chapter, Romans 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What do I need to do, Pastor? Do I need to change my life, reform my life? No, all you need to do is recognize in your heart that you are unrighteous, that you are wicked before a holy God, but that God loves you. And in His love, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die and to pay for your sins. You see, salvation is not God ignoring your sin. Salvation is you believing that Jesus Christ paid the punishment for your sin. And you must believe that. If you believe in your heart, call. He says, for whosoever, verse 13, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Jesus Himself said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The truth is you will never come to Christ unless you first see that you are a sinner in need of His righteousness. Now that's the gospel. But as he's writing to the church at Corinth, he says, I preached to you this gospel. You have received it, but now you stand in this gospel you're saved by this gospel, and so he's bringing that back to memory. And I wonder, as this is Family Sunday, if we are exhibiting the gospel in our homes. How might we exhibit the gospel? Well, I think an appropriate verse in John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world. We might ask, what is it that moved God to action? What is it that moved God to send His Son? What is it that, what is it that, that God, uh, what is God's regard toward man that moved Him to do that? Love. You see, the Bible says, For God so loved the world. What is it that moves us. 1 John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's who He is. And because that's who He is, that is what He does. And remind, let me remind you of that love. God commendeth His love toward us, Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love that He demonstrated. But if you notice that love, that is the pri primary moving factor, but what does love move us to do? What did it move God to do? It moved God to sacrifice. That's what it says. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave His Son as a what? As a sacrifice. And so uh, the love moved God to make a Sacrifice. That sacrifice cost the very life of Jesus Christ. 
But we not just learn about the moving factor love which moves to sacrifice, but we learn about the magnitude because as for, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, the magnitude of this is that on the one hand, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. If you do not believe on Jesus Christ, you will perish. That was the magnitude. But then there is the need. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You see what God did? By His love and His sacrifice and the magnitude of the moment, He met the greatest need of man. He that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Now those are the elements of the gospel. And I'm wondering in our homes if those th same things are exhibited in our homes. If we have heard the gospel preach, and if we have received the gospel, and if we stand in the gospel, are we indeed standing in the gospel? So let me ask you this. What is the moving factor in your home? Is it love? By the way, uh, love is a standard where we might know the fruit of that. Jude one twenty one says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so we are encouraged as Christians to keep ourselves in the love of God. And so here is what I'm inviting you to do, Christian, today. If you've received the love of God, then you understand something about love that the world does not understand. God died for His enemies. That's what He did for those who sinned against Him. And that's the standard of love. And often when we think about the world, the world has a, a peculiar understanding of love. Love is often self-motivated. What is it that I benefit from it? What is it that moves us? The benefit of others or our own benefit? The gospel teaches us that we ought to be moved by the benefit of others that's particularly true in the home. What is it that motivates me? The second question is this, what sacrifices have I been willing to make? If we are going to exhibit the gospel in our own homes, and we know that the love of God was demonstrated by a sacrifice, I wonder if the love of God is expressed through us, how much sacrificing have we been willing to make? Now that's quite a serious question. Ephesians chapter 5, he talks about husband. He says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Well, what did he do for the church? He gave himself for it. He offered himself as a sacrifice. So when was the last time in our own homes we exhibited the gospel where we denied our own needs or sacrificed our preferences and our needs for the needs of somebody else? By the way, parents have to do that with children. Husbands have to do that towards their wives. Wives have to do that for their husbands. Friends must do that for one another. When was the last time that we demonstrated a sacrificial spirit towards others? There's another thing we learn. By the way, uh, there's a, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, there is a description of what love is in action. It says this. Let's see how we're doing with this test. Charity suffereth long and is kind, envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. That's what he says. What sacrifices have been, we been willing to make? What need are we meeting in the lives of others? I know how the world works. The world uses people to meet their own needs. That's not the way the gospel works. 
How can I be used to meet your need? That's the gospel. But the last question I have for you and we're done. What do my interests, what do your interests, what do our interests reveal about ourselves? God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. What is that? What interest did God have? His interest was for the redemption of man. He met the greatest need of man by a sacrifice which was moved by love. And I know there is simplicity here, but I wonder those of us who believe the gospel, who've heard the preaching of the gospel, who've received the gospel, do we truly stand on the gospel? Is that gospel exhibited and demonstrated by the way we live and conduct our lives? You see, the standard is God's love. It is not a, a standard that we come up with. It is a standard that is exhibited in God, and we must keep ourselves in the love of God. And so may our homes always be a gospel-centered home.